Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be hailing from. My name is Eric, the IT Guy Hendricks, and you are watching Red Hat Enterprise Linux Presents, episode number 52. Today, we're going to be talking about Red Hat Enterprise and uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux for the Edge. Um, so before we bring on our guest, I've got to bring on one of my favorite co-hosts of all time, the one, the only, Mr. Brian Smith. Hey, Eric. How's Welcome, it going? Brian. How are you doing? Uh, as you can tell, I've had a little too much caffeine today, but it's it's good. It's good. Was, some, was something different with that intro, that intro uh, video there? You know, as, as you mentioned it, there there might have been. Um, we uh, we were actually talking in a planning meeting last week uh, about this episode, and as you'll see, our, our guest today, Mr. Ben Briard, is uh, quite the musician. And so I, I, it started out as a joke, but I put the the question out to the entire Rel team to uh, put some music to uh, to our intro video uh, to our bumper. And uh, Mr. Tom Hyde, I uh, hope, hope you heard that and saw that, but uh, we, we got that video up today. So Rel, Rel Presents is, is big time now. We've got, uh, we've got intro music for, um, <clears throat> we've got intro music for, for, the, for the show. But that's not all, Brian. That is not all. We spared no expense in that we pay for our, our streaming service. And uh, they actually added, uh, if you look up here, we have QR codes now. How awesome is that? Very good. <clears throat> so that QR code will actually take you out to a Discord server uh, hosted by our friends over in the Enable Sysadmin community. So if you've looked for how to do things on Linux, you've probably seen Enable Sysadmin blog posts. They're amazing. The community over there is awesome and it's growing. Uh, so Tyler and friends help hook us up with a Rel Presents uh, room on that Discord server. So you can actually join us, chat live, uh, during the show, and the conversation tends to continue after the show. So, you know, just grab that QR code. With that said, um, yeah, new music, new uh, <clears throat> uh, new music, new QR codes, but uh, same good old Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Uh, with that said, we're talking about uh, we're talking about the Edge today, and I could think of no one better to talk about Edge than our very own Mr. Ben Briard. Welcome to Red Hat Enterprise Linux, sir. Hello, thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to to talk about Edge. To talk about um, to talk about you know what is Edge, what what does it mean to use RHEL on the Edge, what are, where we're going, and hopefully not blow up a demo. Uh, but before yeah. before we go there, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? You know, what what do you do here at Red Hat, and, and what brought you to uh, to the big red fedora to begin with? Man, I'm like the Jar Jar Binks of Red Hat. Um, <laughs> no, uh, so I've been I've been here for God going on close to 13 years. Uh, I did, you know, kind of the first half here was out in the field with customers doing technical pre-sales. And then I moved into product management because I get super passionate about containers and uh, kind of everything we were doing in the, you know, mutable operating system space. And so that was kind of moved over to work on that stuff. I did a lot with like, you know, some of the newer versions of RHEL, just getting those kicked off and stuff. And really spent the past three years focusing on edge, working with some killer engineers and really, really high value customers for us. And so it's been a, it's been a cool thing to kind of take, take our existing value prop and then expand it out, out for edge environments. So, so, so Ben, when we, when we start talking about edge, like what, what exactly does edge mean? <laughs> it, it depends who you're talking to because <laughs> half the people using edge don't even call right. it edge, right? right so how, how, I, wait, let me rephrase it how do you define edge <laughs> i i like to think of it from like any compute footprint outside of a traditional cloud or data center environment of course like excluding like my laptop or you know stuff like like there's sure there's plenty of exceptions but one way to think of it is um is often the hardware looks different because i like using props so if we have like little fanless boxes like this or like this or like this um <laughs> uh these types of, of systems right where uh you know they may be I, I another another like good framing for this is uh you know harsh like non it friendly computing environments right so if we think of everything we have in the data center like reliable power, reliable connectivity, physical security. Like all of these things are luxuries that you cannot count on. You, they might be there, 
like the security might be a, a really bad lock and a tiny cabinet that I can paper clip my way into. But, you, you know, that's that's kind of the context. And so um, it, it really just changes um, kind of kind of how we have to view these uh, environments, how we manage them over time. Often people want like really long life cycles and stuff. So how do we <laughs> the low touch, no touch and just the reliability. So that's kind of how I look at it. Um, use case wise, it's it's exploding from like all of the existing stuff. So like things we think of like point of sales, uh, you know, all of those things, like a lot of the rail systems that like keep trains from colliding into each other um, or like organizing trains when they have to separate them out and like the speeds they go before they collide into each other and stuff, all of these types of systems and, you know, existing workloads, um, those footprints are going to keep going. Right. And we got to keep powering them. And then there's this whole slew of new stuff, uh, you know, whether it's, AIML, like training or doing inferencing, all those slew of computer vision use cases. So it's it's a broad space and, and it covers covers so much. How's that for a so, long-winded answer? <laughs> I love it. Although I'm glad Brian reworded it to your definition and not all the definitions. We'd, yeah. we'd be here all day. Uh, but uh, so I, I imagine with, with something like, uh, you, you mentioned, less than ideal spaces for for traditional rack based servers so how does that, that that also translates down to the operating system because you're you're looking at being rougher on your hardware you're looking at um, probably a decreased life cycle of that hardware just due to conditions you go from 110 degrees to 20 degrees whatever the case may be how how does that how does that play out on the on the operating system level yeah um i think in a couple ways, um, basically, on one hand, you think uh, an OS, I don't care about the OS. Like, we don't want people to have to care about the OS. But with that said, we provide um, like a huge amount of value in just the underlying platform. And, you know, we're in an interesting time right now where a lot of people are, they're redoing architectures as they're moving to more cloud native infrastructures and everything else. Um, I think one of the best value plays that we have right now is bridging those two worlds without like throwing everything out and reinventing the wheel, trying to get people to the new space. We can run traditional apps and containers at the same time. It's freaking amazing. Whoa. So let's not reinvent the world. Let's just get people where they need to go. And so I think, I think even that right there is, is, is massive value from, from the OS side. Right. So, so we have something called RHEL for Edge. Like, what, what exactly is that, and how is that different from from RHEL? Yeah. So I, I'll, before marketing yells at me, it's a, it describes a feature set. It's not a product, not a different operating system. We have one product, <coughs> one OS, uh, but we do have kind of a deployment model in RHEL that is very, very well suited for these little little boxes. It works great on big servers too. We have plenty of people using it in the data center. But um, uh, the, the idea is um, rather than, if we think like how a traditional rel box, right? You kickstart it or you've got an image you deploy. Uh, and then like we want a highly dynamic system over its life, right? Because we're going to update it. You know, we're going to change the RPM content. We're going to change the applications. It's going to morph. And that's a, that's a big feature of the system over its life. Um, but like, let's change the context a little bit. If I can't automatically reprovision, if something blows up, I can't get hands on keys because I've got to roll trucks out to sites. Um, you know, I now have all these different things here. And oh, and like, if I have 2 million devices, oh, crap, now the stakes are really high. And I don't want to be the guy that sends a poison pill out to all. of them. So now, like, all of a sudden, a snowflake is not just expensive like in the data center yeah exactly the chick-fil-a thing exactly right um a snowflake is now catastrophically expensive uh, and so uh it's it's interesting so what we've done with real friends like what this is a deployment model so uh we use a core technology of rpm os3 image builder it's going to build an rpm os3 compose this is the first time we've supported customers building their own rpm os3 uh, this was, by the way, the number one most requested thing back in the old Relatomic days. Um, so you can build your image, and then what this gives you at runtime 
is you have the best like features capabilities of a package based operating system, ease of content. I can change it through updates. Um, I got a long life cycle, you know, all of the traditional value prop. Then we get like, it's like a runtime management, more like an embedded operating system where I have AV boot things I can roll back. Um, I have some really cool technology to make that even better. Uh, but it really just solves a lot of problems. Uh, the classic one is like, if you're, if you're running DNF update and you lose power, there's a decent chance your box may not boot. Like that's not something we can, we can, we can stand in this world. And so, so yeah, the Royal Fred stuff is really, really <coughs> great. excuse me, didn't mean to cough into the mic there, but, uh, and I think for, for our listeners, something to point out is the, the A to B upgrade process that Ben was talking about, things like RPM OS tree, uh, while it's different technologies under the hood, we, we deal with this type of upgrade process all the time in our day-to-day, -day, uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. If you have any type of a smart device, it's doing this kind of an upgrade. When you download, when you download a new version, it downloads in the background, it restarts, and what it's doing is it's moving that it's it's moving that that boot image into um, into uh, into play, and so when you boot up again, you're in the new version. And something that's that's great about uh, uh, the the rel implementation is that if you run into that failure, um, and maybe Ben can talk a little bit more about this, what what the operating system will actually do will actually boot back into the old environment. That way you can get access to logs, you can see what happened, maybe it was a corrupted download, you can kick that off again. Um, so at least with these types of automated upgrades, that takes care of hopefully upwards of you know, 95, 97, 98%. So you've only got these few outliers that you need to go and try again. Yeah, um, so it, it's super resilient on the other. Actually, one of the things we've heard customers have liked the most is <clears throat> the fact that this is the most efficient way to get updates over the wire to these devices. Um, and a lot of times that's the big constraint on these environments. And you don't wanna clog your pipes with packages, right? You wanna use that for your applications and like the actual things that matter. And so just being able to minimize those updates and being able to patch systems where you previously couldn't is like a really big deal. Um, and yeah, and if you restart it, it'll pick up where it left off and we don't have to redownload everything, you know? So all, all of that stuff is like super resilient. So, so this is essentially a, an alternate way to, to to package and distribute the operating system, but you still have access to all the the same packages from RHEL, right? Yeah, we use the same same repos. Uh, you can you can get the exact same like manifest of everything from you know a regular RHEL system to an RPM OS tree box. Um, so yeah, it's a, just a really cool way to version it. The other thing I like about it is when you make that image, it's a point in time, like it's a release of this day. It's not like I installed 8.4 and I updated it in March, Tober. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's like, it's a point in time <laughs> release. Um, so that it's, it's, you know, and the whole idea is right in the field, you want to go from known good to known good to known good forever. Right. None of, none of this. Well, we didn't actually run through the test on that box, so we don't know what's going to happen. It's probably, probably okay. Let's let's go. All right. So we want to take away all the uncertainties we can. Yeah, and that brings so up. When, yeah, no, yeah. I was going to say that brings up a good point. So, like, if I want to, if I want to get started with with Rel for Edge, we don't necessarily have like an ISO image I can just go download, right? Can, can you talk a little bit about like how how do you how do you get Rel for Edge? Like how do you install it and, and get up and running to try it out? Yeah, it's a good point. We and we kicked around the idea of making like a pre-made one to just make it easy for people to get uh, you know look at. <coughs> Love you know type in feedback on a chat if you guys want to see something like that. But what we do now is because you know the and we talked about a little bit the depth and breadth of edge it's so big it's so vast and so it, one of the, it's challenging if you're trying to make a one size fits all it just ends up growing in size until it covers all use cases and now it's not like a purpose-built thing so um, the front door to this is image builder it's a tool you, you can use a hosted version if you don't want to mess with installing it uh, you know give you the same release to run on prem uh, to make it easy um, and if you just take the defaults, which I do 90% of the times, so you end up with a, we'll give you a small at core install. For those of you familiar with Kickstart, you know what I'm talking about. It's just kind of give me a kernel, system D, bash, firmware, that type of stuff. 
and we'll add the container engine on top of it. So Podman. Um, and there's a lot you can just do with that. And then of course, if you need to add more content, third party stuff, rock and roll. And, and I actually got asked this question a few times, uh, I think around summit last year of why we didn't provide that, that image. And, uh, we had Terry Bowling on the show just a few episodes ago, and he and I got into a discussion about the fact that no matter what we put on an ISO image or no matter what packages we, we classify as uh, critical will be wrong a hundred percent of the time because someone in the bank is going to want this set of packages. Someone over at a telco is going to want that set of packages. And it's just like, yeah, you know what, here, here's, here's the, here's the recipe book. You go build your own image. You determine what packages and what services are going to be running on your thing. You know, don't, don't ask us to do it because we'll be wrong. <laughs> yeah. We, and it's funny. We spent a lot of time actually looking at like, what is a minimal operating system? And it turns out, it's it's uniquely the things the person you're talking to cares about that is minimal from their perspective and right. yeah there's overlap like we can agree on the kernel right um but not much else so uh it's it's really hard to like pare that down and and make an opinionated uh call you can you like the the like mu oh, i can't talk uh but if the end use case is like super well defined then you have a better shot of making a highly opinionated thing solve that use case. And unfortunately, just edge is so big and broad, it it's really, really hard to to solve it. And you know, we've toyed with the ideas of having like a kiosk profile, um, container host node profile, uh, a hypervisor profile. But you you kind of have the same problem. So at some point we may have we may have more of these like starting points. You can start here and then add to that. Uh, there are options and there are things we're going to do to make it make it cooler. But yeah, it's yeah, can't have it both ways. Right. So so you've mentioned, you know, containers a couple of times um, in, in passing. How do how do containers, how does Podman, how does that fit into to Rail for Edge when you're when you're working with these kinds of systems? Well, Brian, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, so uh, it's uh, I, you know, the whole the whole world is moving towards containers. By the way, if you're if you're listening to this and you're like ignoring containers, stop it. Um, go get it together and like, yeah, go get into the stuff. Um, this is the the world is is moving to this place, and so uh, the growth there is huge. Um, there is still growth outside of containers. And so I think there's a there's a really compelling story of running traditional stuff with containers side by side. There's also a great story of running things uh, within a Kubernetes interface on top of these nodes, which is something uh, you'll see more from Red Hat later this year. We already did an announcement on Red Hat Device Edge. I won't get into it now, but super, super awesome stuff. Uh, but but yeah, er everything is going containers anyway. So uh, it's it. It just makes sense for all new stuff, in my opinion. I'm highly biased, though. So, yeah. And it, I'll, I'll add on to my own bad answer that uh, Podman is particularly good at doing this uh, from like a rel perspective. One of the things we struggled with in like the early Docker days was the Docker daemon. Great technology, but it was something that needed a fair amount of like care and feeding, right? Like troubleshooting one on one on Docker is like wipe out the Docker storage thing, repull everything. Like there was all of these things that after a while were just like maintenance touch points on the operating system. And basically Podman integrates so much better into the OS. Um, it is a beautiful thing. In fact, when we get to the demo, I have some cool things to show about uh, how Podman kind of integrates really well and, and some cool things. It does, does does that have anything to do with the, the shirt you're wearing? How it how it integrates? <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. I all all roads lead to System D. Anytime I'm in a conversation, it's really about System D at the end of the day. <laughs> right. right. No. Yeah. But yeah, the, in fact, in fact um, we were talking about this earlier online. Uh, two weeks ago, I just learned about the coolest new thing you can do with system D. And I had no idea it's in rel nine. This is like life changing stuff. And like, we should we should talk about that later if we have time. Um, 
Yeah, I want to. I want to. I want to hear what that is. I don't want to oversell it, but it will change <laughs> right. your life. Um, so, so, so with with uh, Ralph Edge, like by far the, the coolest feature that, that that I'm excited about is is Green Boot, and mm. and I, I just you know I played around with that quite a bit. It's just an amazing technology. So can you can you talk about like what is Green Boot? What does it do? And you know what are the use cases? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Green Boot is super awesome. We've never... Okay, so it, what is a failed state on a system is actually not easy to answer um, and automatically detect uh, what does failure mean to your workload, to your box, your operational environment. It, it's, it's tricky to define. Um, and so what Green Boot lets us do is it links the OS update version to the bootloader and up to that chain to your workloads. So with Greenboot, you get to tell us, or, or not us, but the operating system, what is <laughs> what is a good state and what is a bad state? So classic example I like to define is, you know, most of the time people have like one, two or three, like really critical applications on a box. <laughs> In a classic enterprise deployment, there's like one application per box. But let's say in the edge hardware is limited, so we've got three critical things. And then I've got a bunch of like system services that I really need, SSH, you know, that type of stuff. Um, what we can do with Green Boot is we can basically have what we call health checks, really simple scripts to say, like, is this running? Did this start okay? You know, th these types of things. Can I resolve DNS? Um, all of these types of things. And that will equal healthy state. And so if we if we do an update of the system, when we come back online, what we'll do is through the regular startup process, we will we'll run your health check strip uh, strips scripts. Excuse me, I can I can English, um, and and if they come back in in a good state, everything's good. We, we life moves on. If it fails, and like your main application that you care about, that is the sole purpose in this little box's life, doesn't come up. We'll say, uh oh, that's bad. We'll flag it. We'll we'll reboot the box. If it fails again, by default, we'll try it one more time. And if it still fails, we'll go back to the last known good state without a human saying it failed. Um, really, really cool stuff. So we're going to favor uptime of a working environment versus a broken state that requires intervention to fix. Um, and then I'll, I'll just go ahead and dovetail so we we've had that for the operating system you know for several releases now since 8.3 um what we got about a year ago with realm 9 is the ability to do that at the pod have podman basically do that as well at the container tier so if you're auto updating container images we can it, you know if you let's say you push out a bad one uh if it's a critical failure of the container to run Podman will be like, eh, eh, not good. Go back to the last good one. And then the next time you push one out to the registry, it'll you know, go to the newest one and move on. Again, no human intervention. Just I, I think this is like the coolest stuff to increase resiliency of, of workloads. There's one problem though, Ben. Nope, if no problem. I, my audio's out. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> uh my my issue is, you know, maybe I've got 2000 edge devices across the country and it costs me five thousand dollars every time a truck has to roll to go out and fix it um so i can't i can't afford that so how might i how might i start looking at managing this this edge ecosystem yeah so we've got we've got two two paths today so if you um if you have an environment <clears throat> that can call out and use external services. We make this really easy at console.redhat.com slash edge. You can go there, you can create edge images like we're talking about with Image Builder. Uh, we'll give you easy to deploy ISOs and then you can manage and update update your boxes right there. It's all part of the rel subscription, it's all included. Thank you for the link. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. If you're in an environment that needs to be disconnected or like for reg regulatory reasons, you can't be managed an external service like this um we've basically uh we have collections there's there's kind of three core the, the main one is like the os build collection in ansible and what it does is it it really just 
does the building of images and updates with image builder for you and pushes them to an update endpoint and copies basically almost all the capabilities of the on-prem one or the online one that you can run on-prem and really just control everything with Ansible. <laughs> so it's a really, really cool, um, cool way to do it. So we, we've, we've talked about containers a little bit and, you know, Red Hat recently had an announcement about this new Red Hat device edge and, and micro shift. And can, can you explain like what, you know, what is micro shift? What is device edge? How, how does all of this fit into the, the picture of what you've been talking about? Yeah. Um, micro shift as the name implies is uh, really just a lightweight kubernetes version so these little fanless boxes i keep holding up have uh, eight gigs of memory in them and you know if you think about it from like capacity planning perspective you actually you need room for applications and workloads and so you you know you need a lightweight platform right and so microshift is absolutely awesome it's all of the same like backing build tooling and all of the goodness from a qe and like development perspective that goes into openshift goes into microshift and uh it just deploys it needs it needs about two gigs to run i think it may be down to one gig uh, don't quote me but it, it's something pretty small like that if you look at the openshift baseline set it's it's bigger right because it every feature and functionality you add to the cluster takes resources and capacity and other things that while they're really great from like a functionality perspective uh, they come at a hardware cost right so um so yeah so micro shift is our way a really really lean way to run and provide a kubernetes interface on these devices um and what, what we found just from talking with customers is a lot of people are you know they probably have like traditional type deployment today and they're going to stay on that for two three seven X number of years, but eventually they're probably going to at some point modernize how they deploy and manage their applications. And so, and so we have this huge, you know, spectrum of where people are from like a, I want to say maturity model, but like an operational DevOps -y aspirational thing, right? And so, um, and so with Red Hat Device Edge, man, it's it's one skew. It's easy to like. Are you running an edge environment? Is it is it like hardware like this, okay, that's the one to buy. And if you just want to run regular rel, knock yourself out. If you want to add a Kubernetes API on top when you're ready for it, when it makes sense, knock it out. It's all it's one it's one product offering uh, that kind of spans that whole thing. So, you know, we can meet people where they are today and get them where they want to be. Now, I, I feel dirty asking this question, and I'd like to no, no, please, the audience that the, uh, the marketing guy did not write this question. But wait, you're saying that all of that value is fit into one easy to buy subscription? Tell me. I know, that. I know. It's hard to imagine. <laughs> Supplies are limited. <laughs> it's all got to go today, guys. No. Uh, we don't take yeah. ourselves too seriously here on the rail team. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, obviously that was tongue in cheek, but. Um, <laughs> But like all of the edge capabilities we're talking about, like that technology is in every single rel subscription. Um, but we do we do have different price points for small hardware. And that is something not a lot of people know. They're like, they're like, ah, rel doesn't work in on this, it costs too much. Does it? The answer is no, it doesn't. <laughs> um, so uh yeah, and and so obviously having having the microchip stuff in there as well is really, really cool. Not that I want to get into a skew lesson here, just know that we know that know that we got them. But uh so Microshift and Rel for Edge are both included in, in the uh, developer subscription for individuals, is it not? Uh, yeah, all of this is in the free developer SKU so anybody can actually get used you know can grab it now at no cost um, a little bit on micro shift right now it's in developer preview uh later this year it will be promoted to tech preview and then of course from there to ga um so that just the only thing is like call us first before you like put it in production we'll help you but uh you know just know that it's developer preview right now Oh wait, guys! Back, back that application out. We, it's not production yeah. ready yet. Sorry. Too late. It's live. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> well, this has got to be a first for Rel Presents. We we try and break up the show into into halves. So the first thirty minutes is just kind of the host yakking back and forth, and and then doing kind of an interview style. And then the second half is demos. So if you're just joining us, this is Rel Presents episode fifty two. Uh, Brian and I are talking with Ben Briard, the product manager for uh, for Rel for Edge, if, Rel for Edge, right? That's that's what we're calling it these, these days. Also wanted to point out that if you haven't joined our Discord link yet, it's it's right there. Um, grab your phone, take a pull out your camera, join us on Discord. Uh, this is the part uh, where things get really fun. We're going to see if, if uh, Ben can break things. I mean, show us Edge uh, live on the air, uh, and you may want to follow along. So join us on Discord. Um, <clears throat> and with that said, it looks like we have ourselves a bit of a demo. By the way, did you notice that I just got delivered coffee in real time? Amazing. No, no. Wait a minute here. Yeah, I'm, pretty tricky. I'm feeling right? robbed. Yeah. Um, okay. So now that I'm all caffeinated <laughs> up, uh, <laughs> let's talk a little bit of demo stuff. So if anybody here is new to RPM OS Tree, um, you know this is going to be, I think, super interesting for you. Even if you're, even if you've used it before and are pretty advanced on it, I, I think, I think you'll. You'll get something out of this. Uh, I will say we have a lot of uh, cool, more advanced features on the edge side, and we'll do those later. So if you're hoping to go deep on some of the crazy stuff, we'll we'll get crazy next time. Today is kind of going to be more more foundational um, from that side. You heard so, that, you hear you heard it, Brian. He he volunteered to come back. Sounds good yeah. to me. Sounds good. Oh yeah, we'll do this again. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll show you some tips and tricks in this, but I was thinking uh, what we should do is one of these podcasts called This Is Why You Suck at Linux that just talks about things that people don't know in the operating system. Like, that'd be great. Oh. Okay. Plenty, plenty of content for that. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to start baking a cake here. Um and we're actually going to do it. And I'm going to kind of have to do this a little bit out of order so we have something something working in the background while we talk about it. So um, I'm going to fire up a container. This was an image that we built uh, using Image Builder, which I will show you in one second. But we're just we're running this. Um, now, I'm going to deploy a system. And the only reason I'm doing it on a VM is just because, uh, I don't know, displaying console ports is I, I just find this easier, but everything we're doing here works perfectly on, on bare metal here. So um, this VM is up and running now. I'm going to do the stupidest thing you can do in a live demo and tear it down. So if it fails, we'll all have a good chuckle. Um, but how we're going to deploy the system is actually pretty interesting. Um, what we support in the field is obviously you can deploy, um, take our ISO images, DDM to a thumb drive, uh, you can provision from thumb drive. That is actually a really, really popular way to do system deployments in the field. I love doing network in installs. I saw somebody said Pixie in the chat. That is literally my dog's name is PXE. Um, but did you know there's something better than Pixie for network installs? And it's just using the UEFI firmware to boot over HTTP. So that's what we're going to do today. And why that's cool is it works with secure boot. So you'll notice this script has a bunch of blah, 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 secure boot stuff at the end. Uh, so we will be flipping that on uh, because, you know, secure boot's a good thing. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's a good thing. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kick off this box. And then I am going to have to flip over to the environment. If, if I don't catch the screen, it will wait for the Pixie timeout, which takes a while on IPv6. So let me see if I screw this up right now, which which would be great. Okay, Brian, we we need to talk to Ben about ditching Vert Manager for console. Yeah, you were you were you were logged into the web console a minute ago. So yeah, I'm not, I do. I'm not sure what's happening here. Well, here's the thing: I don't want to have to pull that up to quickly escape out of the BIOS. Yeah. Right, um, I'm sure it would work. I just got to note, um, Vert Manager is deprecated, so just oh yeah, uh, 
Um, I'm running an unsupported uh, Fedora Silver Blue okay. system, okay. so it's <laughs> supported enough. Again, we're we are emulating here the production stuff. Um, yes, you're right. iPixie supports HTTP. Uh, it's and iPixie has like phenomenal menuing system. is absolutely amazing. Uh, I don't know if iPixie can work with Secure Boot. So if you go through your BIOS, and you the way you set this up is actually really similar to to Pixie, but the DHCP server will will send it your NBP, which is going to go straight to the shim. Um, this just cuts out more more chained things in the boot process. So anyway, I'll go ahead and kick this off, and I'll show you. Um, I'll show you uh, what we're doing here. So again, I just have a rel ISO image, uh, just the boot ISO. Um, and I, I changed the paths here. So we'll find it in the HTTP server. Oh my God, I'm already seven minutes in. I better speed this up. Uh, we'll pull the stage two image also off the web server. And then I just have a regular kickstart, which I can, I'll show you that in a minute. Anyway, I'm going to kick this off, have it going because it's going to, um, uh, I know. I still use Pixie Linux. We love we love Sys Linux. HPA is amazing. I love all those guys. It's good stuff. Um. Anyway, but this is cooler and doesn't <laughs> use a TFTP server. So this is this is the future. <laughs> um. Okay. And by the way, new hardware uh will require this at some point. So eventually we'll all be here, whether we like it or not. Um. Okay. So we're gonna let this run. Um. I just Control X it to boot, and this is why. Oh God, did everything freeze? <laughs> can you guys hear me? Can you hear me, Eric? Yeah, we, yeah, we can hear you. No, no, don't answer. So he thinks he lost everything. <laughs> oh, that was really weird. I couldn't uh, release my keyboard from the <laughs> console. There's more reason to use cockpit instead. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, all right, so uh, <laughs> that's so fun. I love it. Okay. Actually, let's make sure this is working. Again, blowing that away was... your demo environment for during a live stream. What could possibly go wrong? Hey, look at that. Okay. Anaconda is working. Okay. All right. By the way, uh, the second stupidest thing you could ever do in a live demo is running the latest nightlies. So what we're looking at is the 9.2 nightly. This is pre-beta, even though it's tagged beta. Um, but I have total confidence in this because um, it's awesome, right? Uh, okay. So by the way, if you've ever used Image Builder before, you'll notice, hey, there's a, like a really cool new UI update. And so I hadn't seen this, and so I figure there's probably a couple people on here that may not uh, may not have seen this either. So I did want to just kind of click around and show a few different things. Um, one thing we're, we've been talking about edge images and so forth. Um, I'll show you basically all you need to do if you want to do uh, your own um, is basically just give it a name. I don't have to include packages if I want to get that base set we described earlier. Of course, you can add your favorite ones. A really common use case we have is a graphical kiosk type deployment. So if you want to add the GNOME kiosk package, Xorg, things like that, um, you can you can build a really cool um, appliance uh, that'll do graphical graphical uh, installs for like smart screens, point of sales, these types of things. Um, you'll notice that uh, OS Build has gotten pretty advanced in terms of things that you can configure into the image. I love seeing this. Um, and something really cool that's coming in 9.2 that it won't be in the UI, but it is on available uh, via the blueprints or, or the files that get generated by this, um, you can basically uh, just drop in config files for Etsy. Or if you want to overwrite config files in Etsy, um, you just paste them into the Toml config. And so you think about it, if you're building like, mm, I love that. like a an, an appliance for a piece of machinery that just you know needs to boot and needs to be, it's, it's a static thing. It's a ship and forget model. Um, we can just we can put everything we need into the image, right? And enable all the services. So if you do, if you are dropping in uh, uh, unit files, we can start those under the regular service thing here. 
um, and just ready to rock. So really, really cool stuff. Um, but I'm just going to go with the defaults. I don't actually have to do any of this stuff. I'm going to get, um, oh yeah, let me just view, create my testing thing. Uh, again, I'm going to skip all the configuration here and just go straight to create image, edge image output. There's a few different types here. We have these explained in docs. I won't get into all of it here, but really the edge container is probably the one that uh, people use the most. And if you're like, what do I do? This is where you probably start. Um, if it's your first one, you don't need to type anything here. Just hit next and go. Eventually, we're going to start this container and use it to update and build our updates from. And so when you make an update, like a child from that, you'll, you know, here's the repo we're actually using today. Just drop that in, hit next, and build the image and go. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, okay, I'm going to, let me cancel out of this. I just wanted to show the, the new UI a little bit because it's pretty cool. Um, okay, in this box, we're we're, we're writing the image to disk. Uh, let me show you the kickstart we're using here. Um, if you've done kickstarts before, this is going to look really familiar and easy. We're just you know, setting the correct time zone for the entire world. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, we're wiping the disks, uh, just auto part, because that's good enough for what we're doing here today. Um, using a super secure password. Um, and then here's my real public SSH key, which anybody's welcome to <laughs> screenshot. I don't care. Uh, but you'll notice what's different here is like, there is no percent packages section, right? This is going to pull the container that we made in image builder, which is running right here on this terminal. Uh, so that's really the only thing that's different from a kickstart perspective. And then in post here, what I'm doing is uh, yeah, yeah, no SC Linux zero uh, on this setup, nor would any Red Hatter ever condone that. Um, that's that's hilarious. Um, actually, I seriously think I have SC Linux off on my laptop right now, so I'm a big hypocrite. Uh, okay, but uh, in the in the post section, all I'm doing is I'm dropping in a few unit files. Uh, again, with the next version, we'll have in, internally in like a week or so. I'll just dump these in the blueprint. But so I'm dropping in a few unit files, enabling them. I've got a container I'm defining that's being brought up. Um, so all of this is actually in a GitHub link that we'll we'll share at the end. And uh, yeah, so it's pretty pretty simple stuff. I bet the box is getting close. Yeah, it looks like it's finishing up. How, Installing. And, yeah, go ahead. And just just a quick question: How do you make that Kickstarter file available? To, to the system that's being built like was, was that one of the boot parameters that you had yeah i um i i edited grub to do the inst.ks and just pull it okay. off a web server okay. um okay. if you're provisioning in a field in the field um you may or may not be able to pull it off a web server it just depends on is, is there anything sensitive in this that you know could be an issue um so it is easy to pack these in a thumb drive you know there's there are different ways to handle um, the kickstart. And actually, one of the cool things we should circle back to in a future one is we have a total installation path. Um, Anaconda is like what we recommend if you're, um, you know, you've been, you're a Red Hat user for a long time. You know it really wants partitioning or install stuff. Anaconda is the path that we, we would recommend. Um, but if you just want, like, hey, put this image on this disk. Uh, we have what we call a simplified installer. Um, that that's what it that's what it does, and we can actually send all of this config stuff I did via um, via Kickstart. We can inject that via Ignition, so it runs really early in the first boot process. Uh, super powerful. We have another technology FDO, which we don't have time to get into today, but it's it's really cool too. So um, there are really cool ways to to streamline and optimize this even further uh, for different environments. All right, so my box is booting. I'm going to go ahead and SSH to it. Assuming it's booted far enough to SSH into it. Hmm. Look at that. There we go. 
<clears throat> How about that? Okay. So I, I know installing Linux is not fun. Trust me, we will get to the cool part. And by the way, that was actually really painless for a Linux install and deployment. All I did was make a container, started it, you know, set up HTTP boot to look on a web server to grab everything, and now I have a box. That is pretty powerful when you think about it. No TFTP, and I have secure boot. Okay, uh, <laughs> RPM OS tree status. Okay, uh, I only have one deployment on this box, right? We just installed it. We all watched it in real time. It's like like watching paint dry, right? Uh, okay, this is so two days ago. I made this release of the OS. So I know every single RPM package that's version in this commit. We can do introspection. All of my RPM query commands are here. Um, you know, like I know this is a point in time release. And so if we're doing weekly, quarterly, whatever our standard update cadence is, um, we can basically, we'll do this rinse and repeat. So we'll make image builder, make a new container, fire that up as a repo, and then our boxes will pull the delta and update. Why this is so cool is that the update is staged in the background. Nothing is changed at runtime on the system. Let me say that again. Nothing is changed at runtime on the system. I'm going to go from known good to known good spot. And let me show you some cool things to help make that easier. By the way, um, if, if this works, it should have pulled. Okay, yeah. So I've got a little. Uh, I have a little application running. Uh, depending on how slow I talk, at some point it will start eating up all my CPUs on this box, which will probably be fun for my webcam. Uh, <laughs> okay. Oops. Uh, all right. So this is our little box here. Um, I oh, let's start talking about how great System D is earlier. Um, anybody out here still using Cron? Actually, I'm just kidding. Don't admit that in the chat. Um, let me show you uh, what you should be using uh, in 2023. Actually, you should have been using this 10 years ago. I'm kidding. Uh, I've got several timers set on this box. And these timers, I think of this as like a modern cron. Why is this cooler than cron, you ask? Well, you can do everything you can do in cron and a whole lot more. And look at this. It's even going to do the work for me and tell me, um, okay, so in one hour, approximately 57 minutes, our PMOS tree is going to check and see if there's an update. If there's an update, it will automatically stage it in the background. Hey, that sounds really cool. I like that. Thanks for showing me that, Ben. Okay, you're welcome. That's pretty neat. Um, I <coughs> configured Podman auto update for that one container we have running here is set to do auto updates. And I have a timer set. We can see the next time it will go off and, uh, five hours, 12 minutes. Uh, apply update is one that's in that GitHub repo I mentioned earlier. What this does is it says, hey, is there a new RPM OS tree staged? If, it, if, it, if there is an update staged locally um, during a maintenance window, which happens in five hours, 41 minutes, we'll go ahead and apply that update, which means we're gonna reboot into the new update. Um, and so that's what this timer is gonna do all on my behalf and of course, um, I'll talk about one other thing that is super cool about using timers on a system that is actually, I think, really hard to do with cron. Um, somebody correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. Um, we can okay. If you're updating containers and you're running your own infrastructure, do you want two million container hosts updating and pulling at the same time every week? No, you do not. That's a terrible idea. So we can splay. In fact. Let me show you what we've done. System CTL status. Oops, timer. Um, oh yeah, one reason system D is really cool is we can do drop-ins and in splay.conf. Uh, let's see what that is. Cat, boom, look at this. Randomized delay second, 72. 100 seconds. I don't remember what that is in hours. Uh, I did the math at one point. But um, if you if you have 2 million boxes, maybe you want to randomize their check-ins between 12 hours or 24 hours or 48 hours, right? And that will just randomly spread out your loads. So you don't have a peak of 2 million. Amazing, right? Really, really simple stuff that the OS does. 
And yeah, like we said earlier, right? If you don't know this stuff, that's why you suck at Linux. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm just kidding. We're all learning. We're all here to learn. This is good stuff. Okay. Now, um, by the way, we only have nine minutes, so let's get to the good stuff. Uh, okay. Uh, that first image was built for RHEL 8, right? I built a RHEL 9.2 nightly image, right? So I'm going to go ahead and fire that up. Uh, again, I'm just starting the container. Uh, go back to my node. I'm it, Normally, when you're upgrading... You type RPM OS3 upgrade. Uh, we're going to do a different one. We're going to rebase for an upgrade. Rebase. And the branch is, can you guess what version of RHEL it's going to be? Nine. Twelve. Yeah. Darn. So just, just to back up a second. So right yeah. now we're, we're on RHEL 8. Is yes. This, this, okay. Okay. I just want to clarify. Right, let me prove this really quick. Actually, I don't need to prove it yet. I'll go ahead and run this. Okay. By the way, this is going to take, oh, no. Uh, what did I type wrong? Oh, no. You have 68 and 66. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, my God. There's my heart stops. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So we're going to watch this. This is going to take about a minute, right? We're pulling, um, we're pulling this in real time. This is just the delta between rel eight seven that we have on here. Um, but yeah, this will take a minute. In fact, let me, uh, while this is going, let me just pull up a new tab. So we don't want to, I don't want to wait for that. Um, let's see OS release. Okay. So yeah, this is eight seven. Uh, you said we saw the date on the release that I did two days ago. That's like the latest errata version was from that date. Um, just to prove while it's upgrading to RHEL 9 here. Um, everything's still going. My application, my container is still going. That's fantastic. Of course, it's still going. Um, all right, this is at 78%. So you, you managed to start a holy war in the chat, Ben. Thanks a lot. By the way, I've talked to Linus, and he has come around on System D to a degree. I don't know if he owns a cool T-shirt like this, but Linus is not. <laughs> yeah, he's not anti. <coughs> well, I don't know. I'll let him speak for himself. Uh, I thanked him for, like, thank you. Like, I feel like I owe my career to you, Linus. And he looked at me. And he just shook his head and goes, I am so sorry. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> that is classic Linus. Um, that sounds about right. Okay, by the way, so, um, oh, no, I just locked my desktop. Oh, crap. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Yep. Are you able to, like, see my screen still? Yep. We're, Hilarious. We're, we're collecting your password as, as you speak. Probably. I meant to hit control L. I hit super L. Okay. All right. So RPM OS tree status. All right. Look at this. Uh, so I've got 9.2 teed up here. We upgraded this many packages. We can see the delta here. Um, yes. Again, there's been no downtime. I want you to think about this. How much downtime has there been? No downtime. All right. Here's our downtime. This is how long it takes me to upgrade to RHEL 9. Now imagine I have 2 million devices. There's no human beings. It's all on the line right now. My job, my career, my family's future. The company is depending all on this going right. Our, our company I'm drawing is this out in, because of this. money right now. Right. I'm drawing this out because this is actually taking longer than I thought it would to, to shut down the system. So for, for those of us... There we uh, go. Oh, never mind. I was going to vamp for a minute. No, no. In fact, I'm not even going to speed up the grub prompt here. Uh, I'm going to just let the five-second timeout happen. We, we should have started a, a, an actual timer. We should. It'll It'll be one to two minutes, but... Um, 
And by the way, this is all locally on my laptop running the webcam and everything else. Um, okay. And, so and I'm actually going to... I don't think we can oversell the fact that Ben just upgraded from RHEL 8.7 to 9.1, which, which I'm I'm a huge fan of the Leap project, and uh, I work with, with a lot of the engineering folks on that often. And um, I think on average, on a small virtual machine here in my home lab, it takes me 15 to 16 minutes to do an in-place upgrade from RHEL 8.latest to 9.latest. And, and what's, uh, we're yeah, easily just, at a third of that time. I was just going to add to you what's, what's super cool too is if, if things aren't working on 9.1, how easy is it to get back to 8.7 8 at this point? Mm. Just, just reboot, right? And just like that in the bootloader. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it here in a second. But see, my app, my container application, you just saw it there. It was, you know, while well, it was checking in. It A few more minutes, it'll start taking load and eating the whole thing. But uh, my main workload, not impacted. Now, a lot happened in the background, right? Not, not only did we move to a major release, we also flipped to control groups V2 or C group V2. Actually, sorry, it's just C group 2 is the, way, this is the correct term now. Um, we're using C run as a container runtime. It's totally transparent. I didn't have to change anything on my application. How freaking cool is that? Um, that That is like, I think, the coolest upgrade experience you can have for it. Now, obviously, uh, Eric, you mentioned Leap. This, of course, is not a replacement for Leap. You need a tool right. like Leap to upgrade an RPM or non-transactional system, I think is the right way to say that. Um, but for the, in this kind of state where we're going from like that AB model, like that, I, I don't know, man. I still think that's the coolest. And then let's say something we didn't like something and we're of course testing in the lab before we blow out to everything uh we just run rollback and we'll see that flip the bit in rpm three status um by the way i know we have to cut it off in an hour but i can stick around to answer questions if that if there's time um, yeah we we sometimes uh go over especially for spirited discussions uh, OS3 status and like the bit flip back to you know now eight is the first one here and I'll just go ahead and reboot so we can go back there uh, and then maybe maybe while we have 60 seconds left I'll tell you what has changed my life in Rail 9 how about that I like it okay uh, I, and and everybody here may already know this this may be me lagging um, but with unit files, you can list dependencies, right? Like this is part of the whole justification for systemd. We can say, when I start this service, it either wants like a soft requirement or a hard requirement requires, you know, these other things or this part of the boot process, right? We can define all this stuff. Um, it, what, and then of course, there's a million other cool things that we can do with it, like add, the, the thing I like to do on like critical stuff is say re, restart equals always. That way if the service ever fails or is killed, it'll just take care of running it for me. It just mm -hmm. destroyed the concept of a one node cluster. That's a thing of yesteryear. Um, if you're defining dependencies now, there's a semi new option. It's not brand new, but semi new. Uh, it's called upholds. And if you type upholds up in the top section of the unit file, uh, let's say you have let's say you have four containers, um, and like the main container, or it could be a pod, however you want to actually put it on the system. But the main container, you can say upholds, and you can list the other three containers. Okay, and what it will do is ensure that those other three are always running, whereas the regular dependencies are a one shot thing, basically, like we will start this for you so that you can start your thing you want, this will continually check and ensure that these are always up to support the main one. And then your main service, you add restart equals always. And now, boom, and like one unit file drop in, I've defined, like, the perfect behavior for my application. Mm. 
I think that's so powerful, especially even if you're just doing, you know, typical enterprise model where I have one service I care about on the box. Um, maybe I want to ensure that the rest of my like fleet, um, like security tools, SSH, whatever these types of things are on, we can just declare that in one line. Done. We've we've improved resiliency so freaking easy. Um, so, so Eric, we need to we need to have a, a rel presents focus only on System D and have Ben yeah. come back. Have Ben come back and tell us all the cool stuff you can do with System D. I think that'd be pretty cool. You know, there is something to that. I mean, I feel like uh, I feel like a lot of folks may not understand why there's why it's such a that have you ever seen this? On how have you ever seen this? Screen? Divided at the screen. Amazing. Uh, but uh, it may be worth having a conversation on why it's such a uh, a major. And I've never seen this before. How did you get to that? Yeah, we let's do a system D deep dive. I bet okay. we can even get some of the guys from the system D team to come. Oh, they bet. may that'd actually be, be online right now. Yeah, we should do it. Yeah, we should. We should. We should totally do that. I think that'd be so cool. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll put it on the schedule. All right, you heard it right there, folks. That's that's how decisions are made in Rust. Okay, not not always. But. Uh, <laughs> by the way, and I went back to eight seven because I don't know. I got scared. You should really be on real nine because you don't now, like how yeah. easy your life right. is with real nine. Okay, but someone tell me uh, in the chat if you liked that upgrade experience. Good stuff. So you're meh. That's okay. I, I, Skin. What do you want, man? It's, it's I want a like two minute live stream. Like the heavens parted. <laughs> Choirs are singing. Yeah. I don't know. It's a Wednesday afternoon. I don't know if I got that much. <laughs> Am I overselling this? I don't, I don't think it. so. No, 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 no. I I personally thought that was awesome. I'm a little jealous because I'm I'm the leap guy, but you know. <laughs> No, again, it, this doesn't take away anything from Leap because it, it is Leap is like when you think about right, what different. it's doing is more powerful um, to get you from A to B. But it's a really this takes uh, the discipline up front, right? That Leap Leap makes all that go away <laughs> for you. So, yeah. So was that was that hand wavy enough? I'm like moving my hands in the camera. Um, sorry. I told you guys I was the Jar Jar Red Hat. See what I did? I just bookend your your podcast. It's great. I, I like that. That's that's well done. Um, you should teach Brian. His, his like the one arrow in his quiver is system roles, which we didn't talk about. Brian, we didn't talk about system well, no, roles. No, we, we mentioned web console though, so I'm I'm good. So that's okay. So it's it's either or. Okay. Either okay. or. So We're, we should do the okay. Ansible collections for all of this. Yes. Yes. That would, would be, be really cool. amazing. We yeah. might be able to trick Chad and Adam to join us. Um, <laughs> that would be cool. We should do Why You Suck at Linux, uh, four-part series. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of good stuff here. Uh, but yeah, actually, we should we should do like a deep dive on like the ignition or FDO at some point or some of the more cool stuff. Yeah, so uh, why, why did it take so long for me to twist your arm to bring you on here? I was just invited two weeks ago. Actually, that's not true. More. We were talking, and, well, you were half, half dead, I think, at at reinvent oh and, yeah, yeah. Uh, i had to really really twist his arm i had to go up and say hey ben we need to have you on real presents to talk about edge like, okay sure that, that's how that conversation went <laughs> um i see the question on was rev os tree i know they uh they did some over uh prototypes using os tree i don't know if that was ever like the the mainstream deployment uh for like the rev nodes um, I don't, I don't but I definitely know that, you know, they, yeah, they may yeah. not have ever shipped that. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that that ever became production, but then again, I could never, uh, something about the, the raid controller in my server here at home, I could never get rev working in, in hyper converged. So yeah, that I do not know for certain, but with that said, uh, we are a bit over time, but, uh, Ben, thank Put you so much for joining us. Really D. appreciate it. Put Ansible and say that that person gets a gold star. That's good. I love it. Sorry, I just ruined your your closing here. No, no, you're you're fine. Uh, you got to call it when you see it. But uh, thank you, Ben, so much for joining us, talking a little bit about Edge. If you're in the audience, give us a thumbs up. Uh, hit that like button. 
uh, if you liked this content, we'll definitely have Ben back to talk more about Edge. It sounds like the System D uh, episode will be coming your way. Um, of course, usually this is part of my outro, but I forgot um, what our next episode is. Brian? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. We'll have to we'll have to look into that. And Maybe a system D. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, what are See, you doing in two weeks, Ben? Let's let's do system D, man. Hey, I'm. Let's if do it. If that's a serious offer, it's booked. All right. <laughs> system control, attend. There we, go. we need a system right. timer to tell us what the next episode is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Perfect. We'll we'll do it. We'll. Do it. Oh, we've, we've got, we want multi-part sessions on system D. Okay, cool. We're, we'll do this. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you, All right, we'll, folks. we'll come back in two weeks. If you use my bad theme music, the, that's my deal I'm going to make with you. Hey, I told you I liked the theme music. It just didn't match the, uh, the video bumper. So if you or anybody yeah. in the audience knows someone who's good at video graphics, please, by all means, <laughs> I will hook you up with the, with the REL logo and, uh, and we'll make this thing happen. Ben made an awesome intro, um, and really, uh, I really like it. It just doesn't fit with the uh, current video bumper, but I'd like a new one. So, hey, if you're out there and you're listening, hook hook a hook an IT guy up, would you? With that said, on behalf of Brian, my co-host, Ben, our guest for today, uh, our product manager for Edge, and the entire Red Hat Enterprise Linux team, thank you so much for joining us. Make sure to subscribe so you get this content uh, and hit the, hit the bell so you know when we go live, because apparently sometimes we don't even know when we go live. But with that said, we will be back in two weeks. There'll be no end of the terminal this Friday as Red Hat offices are closed. Uh, but we will be back next Friday to kick off an arc about Red Hat Enterprise Linux and security. So with that said, I've been Eric, the IT guy. On behalf of Brian, Ben, I've already said this, and the entire Red Hat Enterprise team will see you in two weeks. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks, everybody.